Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our weekly Technologies of the Future. It is Thursday morning here in Australia. We're ready to kick off another day, and a lot has happened, as always. I have a passage this morning from Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near, again. And just realising this morning, this book was actually written in 2005. So keep that in mind as I read this passage. The list of ways computers can now exceed human capabilities is rapidly growing. Moreover, the once narrow applications of computer intelligence are gradually broadening in one type of activity after another. For example, computers are diagnosing electrocardiograms and medical images, flying and landing airplanes, controlling the tactical decisions of automated weapons, making credit and financial decisions, and being given responsibility for many other tasks that used to require human intelligence. The performance of these systems is increasingly based on integrating multiple types of AI, but as long as there's an AI shortcoming in any such area of endeavor, skeptics will point to that area as an inherent bastion of permanent human superiority over the capabilities of our own creations. The book will argue, however, that within several decades, information-based technologies will encompass all human knowledge and proficiency, ultimately including the pattern recognition powers, problem-solving skills, and emotional and moral intelligence of human brain itself. Although impressive in many respects, the brain suffers from severe limitations. We use its massive parallelism, 100 trillion interneural connections operating simultaneously, to quickly recognize subtle patterns. But our thinking is extremely slow. The basic neural transactions are several million times slower than contemporary electric circuits. That makes our physiological bandwidth for processing new information extremely limited to, compared to the exponential growth of the overall human knowledge base. Our version 1.0 biological bodies are likewise frail and subject to a myriad of failure modes, not to mention the cumbersome maintenance rituals they require. While human intelligence is sometimes capable of soaring in its creativity and expressiveness, much human thought is derivative, petty, and circumscribed. With that, I will say welcome. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Brendan. Uh, have you got a one-word opener for us today? Good morning, Lise. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, that's definitely, it feels like we're in the simulation. <laughs> From what I've seen, all these generative agents, generative worlds, and uh, these autonomous agents that's prevailing, and it just goes to show, it's like, are we actually, you know, who we are? <laughs> and are these AI agents already around us? So, yeah, that's me. Yeah, and they yeah. have been since way before in 2005. But one word, yeah. open up, um, <laughs> Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to go for last week's word, overwhelmed. <laughs> There's just too much going on at the moment. Um, yeah. So I was reading a little update this morning of the different things that have happened in AI and OpenAI have opened a, a global office in London and Elon Musk's working with China and there's a whole heap of things happening. Um, you know, when you say overwhelmed, Brendan, your thoughts on the book and that passage? Oh, well, um, I, well, he's got it pretty much down pat, but I think he's I think you're slightly wrong when he said over the next decades, um, it was being what, just maybe less than two decades after yeah, that book. eighteen years. Yeah, yeah. so um, it, it's like uh, we're already half there, right? So uh, you know, we already when when he says that we may be able to get the thinking and then the human brains, you know, a little bit slow. I think the the way to sum that up in terms of the progress is the fact that if we were able to create a human level scientist AI bot today, it would be able to accomplish, I think it was 20,000 years of scientific research every single week, right? Yeah. So when we're talking about the singularity coming and, and, and uh, you know, how slow human thinks, you know, at a rate that humans thinks, that's what we're going to compete with. And that's just one bot. Imagine if we had, you know, on demand, scaled up, right? We could have billions of those scientists, right? And then uh, artificial scientists, right? Working with people as well, because, you know, at the moment, humans are more creative still, right? And they, we, they, they, the bots require our input. And so it's a symbiosis of, uh, of humans and machines. 
just the whole transhumanist idea. Um, but yeah, 20,000 years every single week, right? And um, uh, it's amazing what we're coming, uh, accomplishing. We're up to 15,000 large limited models now, right now, 15,000. <laughs> so, and there's new ones being created all the time. So uh, new capabilities and new optimizations. I did love the different large language models. They were talking, you know, originally open AI is this, this huge, big, you know, one size fits all kind of language model. And now there's industry specific, there's business specific, there's a whole heap of different, um, even company specific was really cool. And we're creating one at the moment where and it's, it's actually not that hard and, you know, to, to say that uh, live yeah. online is I'm not the one actually developing is, um, is quite unique. And uh, we have... Uh, soul machines and soul machines have a configuration tool so you go in and you configure it and this is the one where it's actually a digital human face and it can respond so it'll have a conversation with you and we've pointed that large language model to our youtube channel to be able to say well this is the way that we speak this is all of our information and so these mornings are captured so you can actually go and you can ask questions about past um, episodes and things that we've read and things that we've that we um I guess it's that common language so when you say 15,000 large language models I think about what that's going to do for medical breakthroughs or strategically even making airlines more efficient or you know the um, carbon capture into soil there's a whole heap of different uses that we just have this information now yeah and it's so democratized that uh, you can even fine tune those large language models to your own data. So it's sort of uh, you, you can create your own like you have a whole bunch of NVIDIA A100 GPUs, like what the NVIDIA and Microsoft and uh, you know, a whole raft of others are investing in again. So we're talking about 20,000 of these $40,000 supercomputer clusters that are coming together. And uh, yeah, they're basically raising lots and billions of dollars right now to actually see and become competitors to open AI. But at the same time, you can just download some of these open source large language models and fine tune it, just like you would do with say with Fusion on a particular type of artwork, type of style, you can now do for your own text and the type of say PDS that you have in your deep technical knowledge of expertise. I'm seeing from uh, Google and Palm 2 already starting to have a huge impact in the medical database. And what that's going to mean is that as we fine tune more and more of these large language models to our own preferences, it's going to start sitting at the edges, just as Siri is sitting on our iPhones. It's going to become that personal agent that really makes it easier to democratize that technology. Hmm. I did see one of the updates yeah. this morning that they're able to point the AI at your um, at your DNA and your your genes, and they're mm -hmm. able to identify zombie cells. And so they're claiming yeah. they can reduce aging by being able to essentially uh, just go, what are these the zombie cells? So yeah. the personal AI is, is huge. I did actually right. want to talk about, I guess, the the mindset and the skepticism because mm. you know we're seeing that there's a whole heap of people using it on one side, and it's amazing, and it does all of these things, and then you see the mm. resistance as well. And I think there's a lot of people scared and the fear, and we're kind of in that that place where you know we're we're having um, <laughs> we're on a roller coaster, and it's like, yay! Oh no, yay! Oh no! <laughs> I, mean, um, I said that I went on a roller coaster yesterday, and it was um, exhilarating. So, you know, where are we at and, you know, what are these conversations? I think it was 1.4 billion people downloaded mm. Open AI or ChatGPT, have used ChatGPT or AI yeah. in the last three months. And so 1.4 billion people is, is quite significant, <laughs> um, who are all probably doing the same mm. roller coaster uh, of emotions. What are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, that, that immediate productivity boost is huge, right? And people have seen the power of it. At the same time, you're seeing, you know, TED Talks given by the likes of Yudowski, who's, you know, basically the less wrong blogger, um, becoming, you know, the leader of this AI Duma sort of community, <laughs> saying that, yes, this is great and until you create a species that's more intelligent than us, which, you know, humanity has never done before and it hasn't really worked out well for, you know, when there is a, a more smarter and dominant species on the planet, usually either extinction or best case scenario, you become domesticated pets. And so I'm seeing all these scenarios play out. And um, there is that Future of Life Institute run by Max Tegmark, you know, funded by the likes of Elon Musk. And the irony is that now Elon's, after funding OpenAI, he's created X.AI, <laughs> XAI, with a whole bunch of uh, uh, 
pursuits really to look at, you know, how do we actually understand the universe? And it's starting to see it almost like we're giving up on making sure that humanity gets along for the ride, which is what Neuralink is meant to be started for. At the end of the day, if we do create an intelligent species that's more powerful than us, it's so hard to, you know, be humble and say, well, we actually don't think we can control this level of intelligence, right? We wouldn't be able to think of all the ways to do it unless we find a way to align that AI to basically help do that for us. <laughs> so chicken and egg. Yeah, I think I think the alignment issue is um, twofold. Mm. Um, the first one is that we 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 um we really need to align these models to the uh, I suppose the values that humans have. But we failed in one before we even started because we can't even align the values of humans, right? <laughs> and so we're trying to get unaligned humans to train models to align with humans. And so even if you train the best aligned model, it's not going to be aligned. Always always going to be someone that's not going to like it, right? And so we really need to push that whole alignment with uh, human values and make sure that humans follow the human values, right? Mm -hmm. If we can eliminate some of the competition like scarcity and things like that, then uh, I think humans will be more aligned with each other because most people don't want to fight or conflict and things like that, right? And when you when you remove some of the competition, scarcity of resources, getting the basic needs met, I think you'll find most humans end up cooperating together, mm -hmm. right? And so we need to do the same sort of thing with the machines. Uh, one of the things I've... Uh, looked at is the fact that a lot of the doom and movement comes from people worried about losing their jobs, right? And you can take that loss of jobs two ways. It's a great thing, right? Because I don't have to work every single day and I can actually live life. That actually could be good for the economy as well, right? If you don't have to work every day, you're going to go out and enjoy yourself. You're going to spend money. You get that money cycling through. It's really good for business, right? However, businesses also don't want to pay their workers for not working. Right. And so you need to align this new transition to this new way of working so that people can actually live lives, get stuff done uh, and not be penalised for it. So once we get that sort of idea, then that doom and movement will lessen a little bit because people aren't worried about being left on the side of the road or, or, or on the street because that, as some of the machines taking their jobs. And I think that's the main thing we got to look at, right? Why are we replacing some of these jo uh, existing jobs with machines, especially when they're not even ready yet, right? As they found out with those, um, I think it was a disability support um, organisation where they replaced all their um, the human carers with, with bots and then they found that it didn't work very well. Right? So we need to be more, more careful to find out what, what uh things we transition away to before the technology is even ready and it's aligned and we don't have all these problems. I just wonder with the technology, uh, and we've seen this week, we met with a company that's doing emotions and being able to, to use AI to help detect ADHD or different disabilities. And, you know, I know that that's a, a um, process that's not always accurate and it's actually, there's a lot of friction in it in Australia at the moment and I'm sure in other countries as well. So accurate di diagnosis, but the ability to understand someone's emotions. And I think with technology, you can actually understand a lot more where the other person's coming from. And so the more educated people are, the less that they actually do argue and the more they understand. Do you think technology can remove conflict and are we on the path to that? Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's sort of, yeah, having that power to quantify the individual, I think that's what's missing. So, you know, we talked about alignment, it's at the societal level, but it doesn't get granular enough to understand the individual voter. You know, the joke was that, you know, the ultimate MP, right, the Minister of Parliament to represent you would potentially be an AI agent because it can cater all the policies that actually things that you know, you care about and also you want for the future, but not just you, your community, but also for the entire nation and the world. And so as we are seeing these AI agents start to personalize it based on your immediate, say, facial recognition and uh, different emotional states that you're in, um, that alignment needs to happen there. So if we collectively create these AI agents to help, you know, feed that in to a, a broader alignment of the architecture we're seeing, you know, um, what Singularity Net is trying to do, they're trying to create an AI marketplace to have all these individual AIs come online to basically, you know, have these microtransactions of value 
that represent the individual. So things like what they're showing, what Sophia can do, right? The back end of Sophia is open cog and a whole raft of other marketplaces. Potentially we can put our own AI agents into that marketplace to truly represent ourselves. And that goes to the broader alignment. I mean, at the end of the day, as Brendan would say, you know, what is like human morals and values? It is about the individual. So collectively we need to pace all of those thoughts online. Um, but yeah, finally, I think um, on the AI doomers side, and you know, there are different categories. Have you seen that meme where it's sort of like a bell curve? You have your, you know, your, your pretty uh, everyday person just saying, "Oh yeah, you know, AI, you know, that's it, my my yeah, threat, my jobs." And then in the middle, it's like, "Oh no, but we'll create more jobs, and uh, you know, we'll always find a new way to use AI to increase uh, more things for humans to do." And at the um, you know, sort of the intellectual spot of the spectrum, and the deep experts in the AI field, it's like. Oh wait, AI is actually we're going to make humans completely irrelevant unless we do something about it. And so we're seeing that alignment. Um, and I think with brain computer interfaces, that's just getting to that next layer of you know getting directly to our thoughts and basically truly representing ourselves. Whether it's being able to create emotional empathy with one another, if you can do brain-to-brain -brain communication, we'll better understand each other as a human species. But also feeding that into an AI agent that is dedicated to you right it becomes almost like your attorney your representative um, it will not leak that data and it will really always act in your best interests those are the sort of things we need to see and also making sure that we get taken along for the ride and not become this irrelevant you know sort of dominant species it's uh taking that thing i love mm -hmm. one of our experts uh, paul gordon he does decision science and it's the framework around how you actually make decisions and whether that be individually or as a group or even as a country. We did a, a webinar on a future by design around a 25 million stakeholder decision. And it's really around that process. And he's got a, a framework for it around active stakeholder engagement and identifying, you know, what are all the op options and then having the information so people have the information to make those decisions but being part of that process as well whether the outcomes in your favor or not you actually know and understand the way that a decision has been made and I think that could be game changing uh, I know you know in the decision making process uh, individually it certainly worked and even as a team so you know how do we actually be more sophisticated in that when um, you know it's whether it's running a country or a really large organization I think um, we'll be a lot more educated to be able to to understand each other yeah I think I think one of the powers of these uh these models though is the fact that if you can run these agents on the web sorry on the edge in your home where the data never leaves your your home right so it's not uploaded to the, the mothership um then people are more likely to talk to them trust them um uh, and then uh get useful information from them as long as they're you know capable models um a lot of anger in the world and anxiety that is created by people who don't know things right and they don't know who to ask, or if they do want to know who to ask, they don't want to ask because of embarrassment or worried about repercussions or some of that. So if you can have your own model to talk to, and then you can confide in and talk to, I think that would be uh, well for people's mental health, right? Obviously, it doesn't replace, you know, going to a proper doctor and things like that. But if you never get to that point because you've actually got someone to talk to, uh, about things that are private to you and you don't want to worry about embarrassment or judgment, you can get proper advice from them that the machines could go through all your documents. You know, uh, a lot of um, people have a lot of stress with reading through documents and contracts and things like that. Uh, all these models can now read all those documents for you and explain it in simple language. So at least people have more understanding about what's going on in the world. Um, and then they've got less anxiety, less stress. Um, and then that's better for health. It's also better for anger issues, making people a lot happier. Um, and then, of course, that's better for society because, you know, less angry people running around, stressed people and things like that. Um, and once people are more happy and fulfilled, they can get on with living their life and, you know, less likely to, you know, do other harmful behaviours as well. So I'm going to go yeah. a little bit doom and gloom here and I'll rely on you guys to bring it back. <laughs> so a little realization this morning actually i've always kind of realized but um i saw a little update that um samsung's just updated their software for bixby 
And I was like, oh, that's right. I've got Bixby in the fridge and I'm probably going to say it and the fridge is going to start talking to me because it's like an iPad on the front of the fridge. And I'm like, okay, so hang on a second. I thought that I'd made the trade-off that just Siri and Alexa and um, and Google. So I've got the, the three AI um, tools in the house that you can ask for a song or do whatever you want and kind of know that they're always listening. But I was like, hang on a second, there's a fourth. We invited Bixby and I didn't realise... <laughs> So like a kind of, they're always listening and we're almost like we're trusting that they're going to do the right thing with all of our conversations that they potentially could be recording because nothing's ever really private. Um, I have consciously knowing this because, you know, we work in this area, I've consciously known this and I've made the trade off and said, okay, yes, the value that I'm getting from those systems is worth my conversations as an example is is that a good thing and do we trust them yeah we've sort of always known this right like you say <laughs> it's kind of like you have the phone down and suddenly you're talking about haircuts and then it's like oh wait there's a hairdresser ad coming up like, and so these are ai agents that are owned by the big tech companies will always be acting in their shareholder interests so this is just the nature of how the alignment of the incentives are and so of course if they have an opportunity to find a way to extract that data and monetize it especially for the likes of meta that is you know the advertising business and they will so that's where i think the alternative would be to have your own personalized ai agents that acts for you and we're seeing business models where your data is able to be monetized, even though we might not think that's worth very much at the end of the day, as we're seeing this sort of, as we move from this scarcity model to more of abundance as AI and automation creates more and more resources to be allocated. Well, this is a way to actually allocate those resources in alignment with what the individuals are using that for. So say you're actually sharing all your personal health data, you need things to be done your health where it's a regular checkup to get your scans to get your medical um you know checks and orders around the pills all of that is needs and those needs are aligned with the resource allocations so again you know if we rethink the whole model of you know how the economy works and money in the age of abundance this is a way to actually truly efficiently make that allocation resources if those ai agents that are one personalized for you that actually makes that demand in a market that can supply uh, pretty much oversupply for all of the individuals out there but yeah it'd be interesting to see yeah the development of these dedicated ai agents we're actually working with the likes of a company called ethium that are making these nfmes and this sort of nft is meant to represent your you know ai agent out there to create this data exchange and for companies to actually lend and borrow your data at a you know way that's private secure that you can monetize for yourself i guess that's the choice in the tools that you use it reminds me of ready player one and mm. you know, there's the bad guy who, who was i can't remember the exact percentage but he said you know i've worked out a way that we could actually in virtual reality sell 86 percent of the space on people's <laughs> screen without sending them to hospital essentially <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we can actually have the choice to buy and use the tools that we think are doing the right thing by us. Yeah. I know, it's so dystopian. Yeah, I was going to tell you that just, just with the AI, those, those AI models like uh, Alexa and Siri and Google and even Bixby, they're all pretty terrible, right? Like, like I've, I've had them for years and they've never got better. Right, they're just so terrible. Even the the, the most basic, uh, stupid large language model, like the small ones that you can run on your home PC, even they're so much more capable, right, than those. So I don't know what these large companies are actually doing, why they haven't upgraded them, because that's an actual gold mine, that they're an yeah. untapped gold mine, uh, where you can actually ask these things and they can be harvesting your data, you know, consensually, of course. <laughs> right? um, but, um, but, they, but they're just so bad. So you, you just use it for dumb things like what's the weather, what's the time, that sort of thing, right? Uh, I had hopes that these would be actual proper assistants. And yeah, uh, so I think those are large language models or the, the, the assistants, as long as they're aligned to you and not um, uh, what your data is being used for is okay. It's like sending you product data is fine, but uh, sending my medical information or something to, you know, local law enforcement or uh, or the insurance companies or something like that, that's not that's out, out of bounds. And that's what's been happening with some of these things at the moment, so we need to protect against those, the, the use. 
it is that time of day. So I'm going to invite you both to wrap us up on a positive note of the utopian future of uh, uh, waking up in the year 2030. What would you like the world to look like based on this conversation? Yeah. And, um, oh, yeah, Peter, yeah, over uh, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, I was just um, thinking about uh, what Mark Pesci just given a talk at the Futures Conference called the Synthiverse. And uh, basically, it's all these autonomous agents, generative worlds, generative AI agents. And we're seeing, you know, the likes of the big speeds and then Alexas will eventually all become supercharged with the click of a button to connect these LLMs. Mm -hmm. So they're going to create these simulated worlds and you'll be able to participate in those simulated worlds either through yourself as your digital consciousness or your AI agents as your representative and seeing how this sort of virtual world we're actually interacting with one another and uh, creating all these social interactions to share. And so I don't know uh, if we're already living in that or if it's uh, going to be happening in the future. That's what we're going to see in 2030. Yeah, I think 2030 is easy for, for a lot of this technology because, um, well, uh, not that I like the Apple Vision Pro. I think it's, uh, it's a bit of a <laughs> overkill, but something similar to that, uh, just with the AR slash VR capability, uh, then you'd have and combined up with your large leverage models like uh, Lisa was always talking about her Jarvis agent. Uh, that would be 100% possible, right? We've already got uh, things like Eleven Labs uh, making all the voices. We've got Whisper, which does uh, voice to text and we've got the large language models to actually do that AI plus the AI agents. You've got your own Jarvis with your own avatar and it could be anywhere you've got those glasses on, right? So I don't know, Apple Vision Pro number three or maybe the Quest 5 or some of like that maybe um, will be coming out with this where you could have a small set of glasses and you can take your, your personal agent uh, anywhere and also because of the AR nature, you'd actually have your own virtual reality friends uh, with you wherever you got those glasses on. Uh, so I think that's really, really possible. And I think that's that'll be great for society, but also great for um, interacting with, uh, with your AIs. Well, again, for me in 2030, I love the idea of a best interest bot. <laughs> So it's just the one in the home that looks after me. So like you say, the Java spot and make sure my best interests are always at heart. And then I also think about a bit of a, a mood meter and the way that we're able to measure emotions at the moment. And, you know, how do you actually set target emotions so that you can still feel all of the emotions because I don't want to have a bias that being happy is the only emotion that we should experience. Uh, like the roller coaster, I think it's it's very cool to have contrast to really be able to appreciate life and all the rest. So um, experiencing bliss down to you know an average day might be nice, but you can actually set those in advance that the the computer and the bots can schedule your entire calendar, your entire day, all of your productivity, so you're positively contributing to society based on that language model it's made personally for you. And with that, let's continue building that utopian future. I love it. Uh, thank you, Peter and Brendan, for the conversation this morning. Thank you, everyone who's joining us live online, as well as those who are watching the replay. Thanks for continuing these conversations as well to move the world forward. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.